It's Monday, 23 December. My name is Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel and breaking news out of Boeing. Dennis Mullenberg is out as CEO of Boeing effective today. Replacing Dennis will be David Calhoun, just as predicted on this channel. David Calhoun, the chairman of the board of directors, will now be the CEO of Boeing as well as retain his chairmanship on the board of directors. Effective January 13th, David Calhoun becomes CEO also of Boeing. In the interim, Greg Smith will be stepping in the place of Mullenberg. Lawrence Kellner will be the new non-executive chairman of the board at Boeing. And this comes on the heels of the temporary production halt of the 737 MAX and the most recent failure of the Starliner spacecraft program that failed to dock with the International Space Station just a couple of days ago. We'll go into great detail on that. It's time for an update. All this news comes at the end of a very tumultuous and dreadful year for Boeing Aircraft Company 2019. Hopefully this move will begin to set the tables for a, <laughs> a new start over at Boeing Aircraft to begin to dig themselves out of the hole that they have dug themselves into. The production halt of the 737 MAX is in a large part driven by the FAA. The ball is now in the FAA's court and FAA head Stephen Dixon has said he is not going to allow Boeing to pressure him into accelerating any timeline to get the 737 MAX back into service. The FAA has gone on to state that they are going to inspect each and every single Boeing 737 MAX that comes off the assembly line. Now where is the FAA going to get all this manpower to do all this work when they didn't have it, the folks in place in the first place? I simply do not know. This is going to ca cause huge delays with the 737 MAX. Basically, the narrative on the 737 MAX has been lost. The cattle have stampeded the corral and though the fix is in, the software fix is in, we, Everybody knows what to do to correct the problem with the 737 MAX. Since the narrative has been lost and the FAA is deeply involved with this now, it's going to be a very hard time determining when will the 737 MAX come back into production. And airlines like United Airlines have pushed back scheduling, putting the 737 MAX on their schedule as far back now as June of 2020. Over, that leaves over 700 aircraft grounded, 300 that were already built before the grounding, and the 400 aircraft that were built since the grounding. Now, the folks up at Boeing who are going to uh, no longer be working on the assembly line of the 737 MAX will still find plenty of work on other assembly lines at Boeing, and Boeing was desperately looking for more people to maintain the aircraft that were already built. The 400 aircraft that came off the assembly line that are subsequently grounded, those aircraft need to be periodically r fired up. You got to get the electronics going, fire up the engines, run through a whole pre-flight uh, checklist, and keep the aircraft alive. They can't. The aircraft cannot just sit there mothballed, brand new, off the line. So there'll be a lot of employment for those folks at Boeing in other aspects of Boeing. What really damages the economy across the whole U.S. is all the suppliers that supply the the production chain for the 737, as so much of the 737 production is farmed out to other suppliers. Take, for example, the folks in Wichita, Kansas, that, that build the 737 fuselages. What are they going to do? Once you get that work 
force trained up and operating on an assembly line, what do you do when you lay off all those production workers? Where are they going to, they got to get a job. They got to work. They got to put food on the table. They're going to, you're going to lose your, your qualified staff in this process of this delay of production. What else? There was a whole nother aspect of this that I was going to go on about. And of course, we're still also eagerly waiting the new training module. What is the new training module going to look like for the 737 MAX? Now onto the CST-100 Starliner and the malfunction that it had regarding a off-nominal orbital insertion. <laughs> this is a fascinating subject. We haven't talked about this before on the Blanco Lirio channel. Uh, as you know, my dad, Pete Brown, was an uh, aerospace engineer at Aerojet General, and uh, some of those rocket engines are still in effect today on this project on the Atlas V booster rocket that's used to launch the CST-100 Starliner spacecraft into space. Aerojet also has the contract for some of the smaller rocket engines on the CST-100. There's a commercial contract out now by NASA to get a U.S. production developed spacecraft that's capable of low Earth orbit, that's capable of resupplying the International Space Station. The International Space Station has been orbiting Earth now for an astonishing 21 years and has been using lately more Russian spacecraft to get astronauts and supplies and cargo back and forth to the space station. Now SpaceX has got their first iteration of the Dragon rocket to uh, work to resupply the space station, but uh, Boeing is in the competition with their Star Starliner spacecraft to provide crew space transport, the CST, to the ISS. The Starliner is designed to be a seven passenger crew transfer vehicle capable of being reused up to 10 times with a six month turnaround time. Though this first flight of the CST-100 was totally autonomous, the spaceship does have flight controls in it, yet it features a totally autonomous docking capability with the ISS to save training time and money from the crews. Now the International Space Station orbits the Earth in that low or Earth orbit of about 250 miles and about 17,000 miles per hour. You can catch them on a good clear night often a very bright satellite view when the sun angle is just right, orbiting over the Earth over 15 and a half times a day, 92 minutes per period. The International Space Station is used as a laboratory, an observatory, and maybe in the near future used as a factory to producing things in a weightless environment. And may very well be used as a future staging base for for flights well beyond Earth's orbit. So what happened to the CST-100 Starliner the other day? Even though the mission failed to meet its primary objective of an autonomous docking with the International Space Station, the rest of the mission was considered a huge success. They did successfully launch and recover the Starliner, and the unique feature of the Starliner is it's using a technology similar to what the Russians have been using for years. This is the first U.S. recoverable space vehicle that is designed to be recovered on land. The Starliner uses a series of parachutes and airbags, and they recovered right on point in White Sands Missile Range, New Mexico. So what happened on the launch? Well, the, uh, the launch went off without a hitch. The entire Atlas rocket system, it's a uh, multiple stage rocket, went perfectly, flawlessly. <laughs> and uh, there's a video out there I'll uh, put the link to where you can watch the whole launch sequence in real time right up until the, uh, the uh, <laughs> problem with the off nominal orbital insertion. About 30 minutes after the launch, the United Launch Alliance crew folks that run the Saturn, or the Atlas V rocket, 
their mission control as we're watching them on the video is all <laughs> high-fiving and, and uh, celebrating their successful launch because their part of the mission was done and it was then handed over to Boeing. And it didn't take long for things to go wrong on the Boeing end of the deal as once the Starliner separated from the Atlas V rocket, it almost immediately began firing its little 100-pound thrust rocket motors to position the spacecraft. It started firing very erratically. The idea was to separate from the from the main rocket, coast for a good five minutes or so, and then get in position for one final launch into the final orbit. That launch would fire off the four 1,400-pound rocket motors that would get the space capsule into the proper 250 or so mile orbit to match up with the International Space Station at 17,000 miles per hour orbiting the Earth. Well, right away the spacecraft started these maneuvers with the little 100-pound rockets firing kind of randomly. Controllers desperately tried to get regain control of the aircraft. This is all done autonomously. This is an unmanned flight. The they, Boeing has to prove an unmanned flight and docking with the space station before they can perform a manned flight. Controllers struggle to establish communications with the spacecraft, but in maneuvering, in these random maneuverings of the spacecraft, the spacecraft was tilted in such a way that the communications couldn't get through to the spacecraft for several minutes. By the time that the mission control folks at Boeing were able to get a hold of the space track, spacecraft, the thing had burned up too much of its fuel to even do the last orbital burn of the 1400 pound engines. Plus it had missed the the window of opportunity to do that burn and had blown right past it. So at that time I think the mission controllers decided to just establish the orbit. I think it was in already in the 150 mile orbit. It might have done a small burn to push it on out to 150 miles above Earth orbit and just be satisfied with that low Earth orbit and conduct the remaining tests for the flight and then work on the successful recovery, which they did do very successfully at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Here's an actual shot of the re-entry on 22 December yesterday over Raleigh, North Carolina. There's an animation of the recovery system on the Starliner, and here she is sitting down, setting down at White Sands Missile Range. By the way, that last burn of the 1,400-pound rocket motors, the four, four of them, would have been a short 40-second burn to get it from 150 miles out to 250-mile orbit. So the whole problem why the spacecraft was maneuvering erratically and way off schedule was the mission elapsed time clock. The clock was 11 hours off. There was, a, once again, a software problem that controllers were unable to resolve in a timely fashion because the, they couldn't communicate with the spacecraft because the spacecraft was tilted such that the antennas wouldn't transmit and receive. And the mission elapsed time clock was 11 hours off and so the air, spacecraft was doing a profile that it was supposed to be performing some 11 hours into the mission and I have no idea what that profile would be 11 hours into the mission, whether that was for a re-entry or for another adjustment into another orbital burn to hook up with the International Space Station. But that was the problem that caused the whole sequence of events to miss the autonomous docking with the International Space Station. Now, where does Boeing go from here? According to the contract, since this is all civilian contract now, the contract says that the spacecraft has to perform a successful autonomous docking with the International Space Station before a manned flight can be permitted. Does this mean Boeing has to go back and sh do another uh, unmanned launch? The idea was to do this one unmanned launch and then start with the manned flights up to the International Space Station. Each of these launches using the Atlas V rocket system, which is a disposable rocket system, costs about 100 to 130 million dollars each. There's another huge cost overrun that Boeing is going to have to eat 
in an effort to get this program successfully concluded. If they decide to do that at all, maybe they decide to just go ahead straight with the manned flight program. That'll be some interesting drama. Stay tuned. We'll keep you in touch of how that plays out here on the Block Valerio channel. See you here. Rocket Man. Get it to win it. Go, Pedro, go.